Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we return to The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft. Last time, our narrator, a student on a lone tour of New England in the early 20th century, heads to Innsmouth, a broken-down, sinister fishing town, devastated, dilapidated and depopulated. And there's something more, something our protagonist can't quite put his finger on yet. The people there look different and are shunned by everyone else. There are secrets here. And perhaps the man to tell us about these secrets is Zadok Allen, a drunkard, but perhaps one who knows more about this dark town. It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part two of The Shadow Over Innsmouth by H.P. Lovecraft. Three. It must have been some imp of the perverse, or some sardonic pull from dark hidden sources, which made me change my plans as I did. I had long before resolved to limit my observations to architecture alone, and I was even then hurrying towards the square in an effort to get quick transportation out of this festering city of death and decay. But the sight of old Zadok Allen set up new currents in my mind and made me slacken my pace uncertainly. I had been assured that the old man could do nothing but hint at wild, disjointed and incredible legends, and I had been warned that the natives made it unsafe to be seen talking to him. Yet the thought of this aged witness to the town's decay, with memories going back to the early days of ships and factories, was a lure that no amount of reason could make me resist. After all, the strangest and maddest of myths are often merely symbols or allegories based upon truth, and old Zadok must have seen everything which went on around Innsmouth for the last ninety years. Curiosity flared up beyond sense and caution, and in my youthful egotism I fancied I might be able to sift a nucleus of real history from the confused, extravagant outpouring I would probably extract with the aid of raw whisky. I knew that I could not accost him then and there, for the fireman would surely notice and object. Instead, I reflected. I would prepare by getting some bootleg liquor at a place where the grocery boy told me it was plentiful. Then I would loaf near the fire station in apparent casualness, and fall in with old Zadok after he had started on one of his frequent rambles. The youth said that he was very restless, seldom sitting around the station for more than an hour or two at a time. A quart bottle of whisky was easily, though not cheaply, obtained in the rear of a dingy variety store just off the square in Elliot Street. The dirty-looking fellow who waited on me had a touch of the staring Innsmouth look, but was quite civil in his way, being perhaps used to the custom of such convivial strangers, truckmen, gold buyers and the like, as were occasionally in town. Re-entering the square, I saw that luck was with me, for, shuffling out of Payne Street around the corner of the Gilman House, I glimpsed nothing less than the tall, lean, tattered form of old Zadok Allen himself. In accordance with my plan, I attracted his attention by brandishing my newly purchased bottle, and soon realised that he had begun to shuffle wistfully after me as I turned into Waite Street on my way to the most deserted region I could think of. I was steering my course by the map the grocery boy had prepared, and was aiming for the wholly abandoned stretch of southern waterfront which I had previously visited. The only people in sight there had been the fishermen on the distant breakwater, and by going a few squares south I could get beyond the range of these. Finding a pair of seats on some abandoned wharf and being free to question old Zadok unobserved for an indefinite time. Before I reached Main Street I could hear a faint and wheezy "'Hey, mister!' behind me, and I presently allowed the old man to catch up and take copious pulls from the quart bottle. I began putting out feelers as we walked along to Water Street, and turned southwards amidst the omnipresent desolation and crazily tilted ruins, but found that the aged tongue did not loosen as quickly as I had expected. At length I saw a grass-grown opening towards the sea between crumbling brick walls, with the weedy length of an earthen masonry wharf projecting beyond. 
Piles of moss-covered stones near the water promised tolerable seats, and the scene was sheltered from all possible view by a ruined warehouse on the north. Here, I thought, was the ideal place for a long, secret conversation, so I guided my companion down the lane and picked out spots to sit in among the mossy stones. The air of death and desertion was ghoulish, and the smell of fish almost insufferable, but I was resolved to let nothing deter me. About four hours remained for conversation, if I were to catch the eight o'clock coach for Arkham, and I began to dole out more liquor to the ancient tippler, meanwhile eating my own frugal lunch. In my donations I was careful not to overshoot the mark, for I did not wish Zadok's vinous garrulousness to pass into a stupor. After an hour, his furtive taciturnity showed signs of disappearing, but much to my disappointment, he still sidetracked my questions about Innsmouth and its shadow-haunted past. He would babble of current topics, revealing a wide acquaintance with newspapers and a great tendency to philosophise in a sententious village fashion. Toward the end of the second hour, I feared my quart of whisky would not be enough to produce results, and was wondering whether I had better leave old Zadok and go back for more. Just then, however, chance made the opening which my questions had been unable to make, and the wheezing ancient's rambling took a turn that caused me to lean forward and listen alertly. My back was toward the fishy-smelling sea, but he was facing it, and something or other had caused his wandering gaze to light on the low, distant line of Devil Reef, then showing plainly and almost fascinatingly above the waves. The sight seemed to displease him, for he began a series of weak curses which ended in a confidential whisper and a knowing leer. He bent toward me, took hold of my coat lapel, and hissed out some hints that could not be mistaken. "'That's where it all began.' That cursed place of all wickedness where the deep water starts. Gates a hell. Sheer drop down to a bottom, no sounding line can touch. Old Captain Obed done it. Him that found out more and was good for him in the South Sea Islands. Everybody was in a bad way them days. Trade failing off, mills losing business. Even the new ones and the best of our men folks killed a privateering in the War of 1812, or lost with the Elysi Brig and the Ranger Snow, both of them Gilman Venters. Obed Marsh, he had three ships afloat, Brigantine, Columbia, Brig Hetty, and Bark Cemetery Queen. He was the only one as to keep on with the East Indian and Pacific trade. Though Estrus Martin's Barcaline Malay pride made a venter as late as twenty-eight, Never was nobody like Captain Obed, old limb of Satan. <laughs> I can mind him a telling about foreign parts and calling all the folks stupid for going to Christian meeting and bearing their burdens, making lonely. Says they'd ought to get better gods like some of the folks in the Inges. Gods as would bring them good fishing in return for their sacrifices and would really answer folks' prayers. Matt Elliot, his first mate, talked a lot. Too. Only he was again folks doing any heathen things. Told about an island east of Wahiti where there was a lot of stone ruins older than anybody knew about. Kind of like them on Panapi and the Carolines, but with carvings of faces that looked like the big statues on Easter Island. There was a little volcanic island near there too. Where there was some ruins with different carvings. Ruins all warred away like they'd been under the sea and with pictures of awful monsters all over him. Well, sir, Matt, he says the natives around there had all the fish they could catch and sported bracelets and armlets and head rings made out of a queer kind of gold and covered with pictures of monsters just like the ones carved over the ruins on the little island. Sort of fish-like frogs or frog-like fishes that was drawn in all kinds of positions like they was human beings. Nobody could get out of them where they got all that stuff. And all the other natives wondered how they managed to find fish in plenty, even when the very next islands had lean pickings. Matt, he got to wondering too, and so did Captain Obed. Obed, he notices, besides, that lots of the handsome young folks had drop out of sight for good from year to year, and that there weren't many old folks around. Also, he thinks some of the folks looked turned queer, even for Kanakis. It took Obed to get the truth out of them, heathen. 
I don't know how he'd done it, but he began by trading for the gold-like things they wore. Asked them where they come from, and if they could get more, and finally won the story out about the old chief. Wallachy, they called him. Nobody but Obed had ever believed the old yellow devil, but Captain could read folks like there was books. <laughs> Nobody never believes me now, I'm telling them. I don't suppose you will, young fella. Oh, come to look at you. You have got kind of them sharp reading eyes that Obed had. The old man's whisper grew fainter, and I found myself shuddering at the terrible and sincere portentousness of his intonation, that even though I knew his tale could be nothing but drunken fantasy. Well, sir, Obed, he learnt that these things on this earth as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe them if they did hear. It seems these Kanakis was sacrificing heaps of their young men and maidens to some kind of God things that lived under the sea, and getting all kinds of favours in return. They met the things on the little islet with the queer ruins, and it seems them awful pictures of fogfish monsters were supposed to be pictures of those things. Maybe they was the kind of critters as got all the mermaid stories and such started. They had all kinds of cities on the sea bottom, and this island was heaved up from there. Seems they was some of the things alive in the stone buildings, when the island came up sudden to the surface, that's how the Kanakis got wind they was down there. Made sign talk as soon as they could over being skirt, and pieced up a bargain afore long. Them things liked human sacrifices. Had had them ages afore, but lost track of the upper world after a time. What they'd done to the victims it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obed wasn't none too sharp about asking. But it was all right with the heathens, because they'd been having a hard time and were desperate about everything. They gave them a certain number of young folks to the sea things, tricked every year, May Eve and Halloween, regulars could be. Also give some of the carved knickknacks they made. What the things agreed to give in return was plenty of fish. They drove them in from all over the sea, and a few gold-like things now and then. Well, as I says, the natives met the things on the little volcanic islet going there in canoes with the sacrifices, etc., and bringing back any of the godlike jewels as was coming to him. At first the things didn't never go on the main island, and after a time they come to want to. Seems they hankered after mixing with the folks and having gent ceremonies in the big days, May Eve and Halloween. You see, they was able to live both in and out of water. What they call the amphibians, I guess. The Kanakis told them as how folks from the other islands might want to wipe them out if they got wind of their being there, but they just says they don't care much because they could wipe out the whole brood of humans if they was willing to bother. That is, any as didn't have certain signs, such as what was used on by the lost old ones, whoever they was. But not wanting to bother, they'd laid low when anyone visited the island. When it comes to mating with them toad-looking fishes, the Kanakis kind of balked, but finally they learnt something as to put a new face on the matter. Seems that human folks had got a kind of relation to such water beasts, that everything alive came out of the water and, and only needs a little change to go back again. Them things told the Kanakis that if they mixed bloods, there'd be children as looked human at first but later turn more and like the things, till finally they'd take to the water and join the main lot down there. And this is the important part, young feller. Them as turned into fish things and went down into the water wouldn't never die. Them things never died, except they was kilt violent. Well, sir, it seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was as full of fish blood from them deep water things. When they got old and begun to show it, and they was kept hidden till they felt like taking to the water and quitting the place. Some was more tetched than others, and some never did quite change enough to take to the water, but mostly they turned out just the way them things said. Them as was born more like the things changed early, but them as was nearly human sometimes stayed on the island till they was past seventy, though they'd usually go down under a few trial trips before that. Folks as had took to the water generally came back a good deal to visit, so as a man could often be a talking to his own five times great grandfather who'd left the dry land a couple of hundred years or so before. Everybody got out of the idea of dying. 
except in canoe wars with the other islanders, or as sacrifices to the sea gods down below, or from snake bite, or plague, or sharp galloping ailments, or something I couldn't they take to the water, but simply looked forward to a kind of change that wasn't a bit horrible after a while. They thought what they'd got was well with all they'd had to give up, and I guess Obed kind of came to think the same himself when he chewed over old Wellicky's story a bit. Well, a key, though, was one of the few as had gotten none of the fish blood, being of a royal line that intermarried with royal lines on other islands. Well, a key, he showed Obed a lot of rites and incantations as had to do with the sea things, and let him see some of the folks in the village as had been changed a lot from human shape. Somehow or other, though, he never would let him see one of the regular things from right out the water. In the end, he gave him a funny kind of thingamajig made out of lead or something that he said would bring up the fish things from any place in the water where there might be a nest of them. The idea was to drop it down with the right kind of prayers and such. Well, a key allowed as the things were scattered all over the world, so anybody that looked about could find a nest and bring them up if they was wanted. Matt, he didn't like this business at all and wanted Obed should keep away from the island, but the captain was sharp for gain and found he could get them gold-like things, so cheap it would pay him to make a speciality of them. Things went on that way for years, and Obed got enough of that gold-like stuff to make him start the refinery in Waite's old run-down Fullen mill. He didn't dash sell the pieces like they was, for folks would be all the time asking questions. All the same, his crews would get a piece and dispose of it now and then, even though they were swore to keep quiet, and he let his women folks wear some of the pieces, as was more human-like than most. Well, come about thirty-eight, when I was seven years old. Obed, he found the island people all wiped out between voyages. Seems the other islanders had got wind of what was going on and had taken matters into their own hands. Suppose they must have had, after all, them old magic signs, as the sea thing says, was the only thing they were afeard of. No telling what any of them canicus will chance to get a halt of when the sea bottom throws up some island with ruins older than the deluge. Pick as cusses these was. They didn't leave none standing on either the main island or the little volcanic islet, except what parts of the ruins was too big to knock down. In some places, there was little stones strewn about like charms, with something on them like what you call a swastika nowadays. Probably them was the old one's signs. Folks all wiped out, no trace of gold-like things, and none of the nearby Kanakis had breathed a word about the matter. Wouldn't even admit they'd ever been any people on that island. That naturally hit Obed pretty hard, seeing as his normal trade was doing poor, it hit the whole of Innsmouth, too, because in seafaring days, what profited the master of a ship generally profits the crew proportionate. Most of the folks around the town took the hard times kind of sheep-like and resigned, but they was in bad shape because the fishing was petering out and the mills weren't doing too well. Then's the time Obed, he began a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep and praying to a Christian heaven as didn't help him none. He told them he'd know the folks as prayed to gods that give something you really need, and says if a good bunch of men had stand by him, he could maybe get a halt of certain powers and it could bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. Of course, them as served on the cemetery queen and seed the island know what he meant, and weren't none too anxious to get close to see things like they'd heard tell on, but them as didn't know what twas all about got kind of swayed by what Obed had to say, and began to ask him what he could do to set him on the way to the faith as would bring him results. Here the old man faltered, mumbled, and lapsed into a moody and apprehensive silence, glancing nervously over his shoulder and then turning back to stare fascinatedly at the distant black reef. When I spoke to him, he did not answer so I knew that I would have to let him finish the bottle. The insane yarn I was hearing interested me profoundly, for I fancied that there was contained within it a sort of crude allegory based on the strangeness of Innsmouth, and elaborated by an imagination at once creative and full of scraps of exotic legend. Not for a moment did I believe that the tale had any really substantial foundation, but nonetheless the account held a hint of genuine terror, if only because it brought in references to strange jewels clearly akin to the malign tiara I had seen at Newburyport. Perhaps the ornaments had, after all, come from some strange island, and possibly the wild stories 
were lies of the bygone Obed himself rather than of this antique toper. I handed Zadok the bottle, and he drained it to the last drop. It was curious how he could stand so much whisky, for not even a trace of thickness had come into his wheezy voice. He licked the nose of the bottle and slipped it into his pocket, then began to nod and whisper softly to himself. I bent close to catch any articulate words he might utter, and thought I saw a sardonic smile behind the stained bushy whiskers. Yes, he was really forming words, and I could grasp a fair proportion of them. Poor Matt. Matt, he always was again it. Tried to line up the folks on his side, and had long talks with the preachers. No use. They run the congregational parson out of town, and the Methodist fella quit. Never did see the resolved Babcock the Baptist person again. Rather Jehovah, I was a mighty little critter. But I heard what I heard, and seen what I seen. Dagon and Ashtoreth, Belial and Beelzebub, Golden Calf and the idols of Canaan and the Philistines, Babylonish abominations, many, many tekel of Harshan. He stopped again, and from the look in his watery blue eyes I feared he was close to a stupor after all, but when I gently shook his shoulder he turned on me with astonishing alertness and snapped out some more obscure phrases. Don't believe me, hey? <laughs> then just tell me, young fella, why Captain Obed and twenty other young folks used to row out to Devil Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loud he could hear them all over town when the wind was right? Tell me that, hey? And tell me why Obed was always dropping things down into the deep water to the side of the reef where the bottom shoots down like a cliff lower than you can sound. Tell me what he'd done with that funny-shaped lead thingamajig as Wallachie gave him. Hey, boy, and what do they all howl on May Eve and again the next Halloween? And why the new church parsons, fellas as used to be sailors, wear them queer robes and cover themselves with them gold-like things, Obed Brung, hey? The watery blue eyes were almost savage and maniacal now, and the dirty white beard bristled electrically. Old Zadok probably saw me shrink back, for he began to cackle evilly. <laughs> Beginning to see, eh? Maybe you'd like to have been me in them days, when I seed things at night out to see from the couple at the top of my house. Oh, I can tell you, the little pictures of big ears, and I wasn't missing nothing or what was gossiped about Cap'n Obed and the folks to the reef. <sighs> How about the night I took my pa's ship glass up and seed the reef a bristling thick with shapes that dove off quick soon the moon rose. Obed and the folks was in a dory, but them shapes dove off the far side into the deep water and never came up. How'd you like to be a little shaver alone up in a cupola watching shapes as one human shapes, say? Eh? <laughs> the old man was getting hysterical, and I began to shiver with a nameless alarm. He laid a gnarled claw on my hand, and it seemed to me that its shaking was not altogether that of mirth. Suppose one night you see something heavily heaved off an Obed's dory beyond the reef, and then learn next day a young fellow was missing from home, eh? Then they would ever see hide or hair of Hiram Gilman again, did they? And Nick Pierce, and Llewelly Waite, and Adomer and Sadwick, and... Henry Garrison, eh? Shapes talk in sign language with their hands. Them has had real hands. Well, sir, that was the time Obed began to get on his feet again. Folks see his three darters are wearing gold-like things as nobody ever seen on them before, and smoke started to come out of the refinery chimney. Other folks were prospering too. Fish began to swarm into the harbour, fit to kill. Heaven knows what sized cargoes we began to ship out to Newburyport, Arkham, and Boston. It was then Obed got the old branch railroad put through. Some Kingsport fishermen heard about the catch and came up in sloops, but they was all lost. Nobody never seen them again. Just then our folks organised the esoteric order of Dagon and bought Masonic Hall often Calvary commandery for it. <laughs> Mad Elliot was a mason again for the selling, but he dropped out of sight just then. Remember, I ain't saying Obed was set in heaven things just like they was in that Kanaki Isle. I don't think he aimed at first to do no mixing or raise no young'uns to take the water and turn to fishes with eternal life. He wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy. 
and I guess the others was satisfied for a while. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. Too many folks missing. Too much wild preaching at meeting of a Sunday. Too much talk about that reef. I guess I done a bit by telling Selectman Mowry what I seen from the cupola. Uh, it was a party one night as followed Obed's crowd out to the reef and I heard shots betwixt the dories. Next day... Obed and thirty-two others was in jail, and everybody are wondering just what was afoot, and just what charge again him could get to halt. God, if anybody had looked ahead a couple of weeks later, when nothing had been thrown into the sea for that long. Zadok was showing signs of fright and exhaustion, and I let him keep silence for a while, though glancing apprehensively at my watch. The tide had turned and was coming in now, and the sound of the waves seemed to rouse him. I was glad of that tide, for at high water the fishy spell might not be so bad again. Again I strained to catch his whispers. That awful night. I seed them. I was up in the cupola. Hordes of them. Swarms of them. All over the reef and swimming up the harbour into the manuset. God, what happened in the streets of Innsmouth that night? They rattle our door, but Pa wouldn't open. Then he'd clumb out the kitchen window with his musket to find Selectman Mowry and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and the dying, shots and screams, shouting Old Square and Town Square and New Church Green, jail thrown open, proclamation, treason. Called it the plague when folks came in and found half our people missing. Nobody left but them as a join in with Obed and them things, or else keep quiet. Never heard of my pa no more. The old man was panting and perspiring profusely. His grip on my shoulder tightened. Everything cleaned up in the morning, but they was traces. Obed, he kind of takes charge and says things is going to be changed. Others will worship with us at meeting time, and certain houses has got to entertain guests. They wanted to mix like they'd done with the Kanakis, and he for one didn't feel bound to stop them. Far gone was Obed, just like a crazy man on the subject. He says they bring us fish and treasure, and should have what they hankered after. Nothing was to be different on the outside, only we was to keep shy of strangers if we know what was good for us. We all had to take the oath of Dagon, and later on they were second and third oaths that some of us took, them as had helped special would get special rewards, gold and such. No use bulking, for they was millions of them down there. They'd rather not start rising up and wiping out humankind, but if they was gave away and forced to, they could do a lot towards just that. We didn't have them old charms to cut them off like folks in the South Sea did, and them Kanakis would never give up their secrets. Yield up enough sacrifices and savage knick-knacks and harbourage in the town when they wanted it, and they'd let well enough alone. Wouldn't bother no strangers as might bear tales outside. That is, without they go prying. All in the band of the faithful. Order a Dagon. And the children should never die, but go back to the mother Hydra and father Dagon. And we all come from the Ankh. La, la, Cthulhu Ftagon, Pthngli, Mglavnaf, Cthulhu, Lilia, Wagarnagri Fnagon. Old Zadok was fast lapsing into stark raving, and I held my breath. Poor old soul, to what pitiful depths of hallucination had his liquor, plus his hatred of the decay, alienage, and disease around him, brought to that fertile, imaginative brain? He began to moan now, and tears were coursing down his channel's cheeks into the depths of his beard. God, well, I had sinned before I was fifteen years old. Many, many tackle of harshin. The folks as was missing, and them as killed themselves, and them as told things in Arkham or Ipswich or such places was all called crazy. And you're recalling me right now, but God, what I seen. They'd have killed me long ago for what I knew, only I took the first and second oaths of Dagon off an Obed, so was protected unless an jury of them proved I'd told things known and deliberate, but I wouldn't take the third oath. I'd have died rather than take that. 
It got worse around Civil War time, when children born Sank 46 began to grow up. Some of them, that is. I was afeard. Never did no prying again after that awful night, and never seen one of them close to in all my life. That is, never no full-blooded one. I went to the war, and if I'd had any guts or sense, I'd have never come back, but settled away from here. But folks wrote me things weren't so bad. That, I suppose, was because government draft men was in town after 63. After the war, it was just as bad again. People began to fall off. Mills and shops shut down, shipping stopped, and the harbour choked up. Railroad give up, but they, they never stopped swimming in and out the river from that cursed reef of Satan. More and more the attic windows got aboarded up, and more and more the noises was heard in houses as weren't supposed to have anybody in them. Folks outside have their stories about us. Suppose you heard a plenty of them, seeing as questions you asked. Stories about things they've seen now and then, and about that queer jewellery as still comes in from somewheres and quite all melted up. But nothing gets quite definite. Nobody'll believe nothing. They call em gold-like things pirate loot, and allow the Innsmouth folks has foreign blood, or is distempered or something. Besides, them that lives here shoo off as many strangers as they can, and encourage the rest not to get very curious, especially around night-time. Beasts stalk at the critters, houses, wusses, mules, but when they get autos, that was all right. In 46... Captain Obed took a second wife that nobody in the town never see. Some says he didn't want to, but was made to by them, as he'd called in. Had three children by her. Two was disappeared young, but one gal has looked like anybody else and was educated in Europe. Obed finally got her married off by a trick to an Arkham feller as didn't suspect nothing. But nobody outside'll have nothing to do with Innsmouth folk now. Barnabas Marsh, that runs the refinery now, is Obed's grandson by his first wife, son of Anissa Forrest, his eldest son, but his mother was another of them, as what would not never seed outdoors. Right now, Barnabas is about changed, can't shed his eyes no more, and is all out of shape. They say he still wears clothes, but he'll take to the water soon. Maybe he's tried it already. They do sometimes go down for little spells before they go for good, and been said about in public for nigh on ten year. Don't know how his poor wife can feel. She came from Ipswich, and they nigh lynched Barnabas when he courted her fifty odd year ago. Obed, he died in seventy eight, and all the next generation is gone now. The first wife's children dead, and the rest, God knows. The sound of the incoming tide was now very insistent and little by little it seemed to change the old man's mood from maudlin tearfulness to watchful fear. He would pause now and then to renew those nervous glances over his shoulder or out towards the reef, and despite the wild absurdity of his tale, I could not help beginning to share his vague apprehensiveness. Zadok now grew shriller and seemed to be trying to whip up his courage with louder speech. "'Hey, you, why didn't you say something? How'd you like to be living in a town like this, with everything a rotten and a dying and, and boarded up monsters crawling and bleating and barking and hopping around black cellars and attics every way you turn? Hey, how'd you like to hear the howling night after night from the churches the order of... Dagon Hall, know what's down part of the howling. How do ye like to hear what comes from that awful reef every May Eve and Hallowmas? Hey, think the old man's crazy, eh? Well, sir, let me tell you, that ain't the worst. Zadok was nearly screaming now, and the mad frenzy of his voice disturbed me more than I cared to own. Curse ye! Don't sit there staring at me with them eyes. I tell Obed Marsh he's in hell, and has got to stay there. Hey, in hell, I says. Can't get me. I ain't done nothing, nor told nobody nothing. Oh, you, young fella, well, even if I had told nobody nothing yet, I'm a going to now. You just set still and listen to me, boy. This is why I never told anybody. I, I says I didn't do no prying after that night, but I found things just the same. You want to know what the real horror is, hey? It's this. It ain't what them fish devils has done, but what they're gonna do. 
They're a bringing things up out of where they came from into town. Been doing it for years and slackening up lately. Them houses north of the river betwixt water and main streets is full of them. Them devils and what they brung. And when they get ready, I say, when they get ready, if I heard tell of a shoggoth, Hey, did you hear me? I tell you, I know what them things be. I seen them one night when... <laughs> the hideous suddenness and inhuman frightfulness of the old man's shriek almost made me faint. His eyes looking past me towards the malodorous sea were positively starting from his head, while his face was a mask of fear worthy of Greek tragedy. His bony claw dug monstrously into my shoulder, and he made no motion as I turned my head to look at whatever he had glimpsed. There was nothing that I could see, only the incoming tide, with perhaps one set of ripples more local than the long-flung line of breakers, but now Zadok was shaking me, and I turned back to watch the melting of that fear-frozen face into a chaos of twitching eyelids and mumbling gums. Presently, his voice came back, albeit as a trembling whisper. Get out of here! Get out of here! they seen us! Get out for your life! Don't wait for nothing! They know now! Run for it! Quick! Out of this town! Another heavy wave dashed against the loosening masonry of the bygone wharf and changed the mad ancient's whisper to another inhuman and blood-curling scream. Yeah! Yeah! Before I could recover my scattered wits, he had relaxed his clutch on my shoulder and dashed wildly inward towards the street, reeling northward around the ruined warehouse wall. I glanced back at the sea, but there was nothing there, and when I reached Water Street and looked along it towards the north, there was no remaining trace of Zadok Allen. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part two of The Shadow Over Innsmouth. If you did enjoy it, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with the finale to this story. What will our narrator discover as he delves deeper into the horrific secrets of Innsmouth? I hope you can join me. <laughs>